Hi, I'm Matt Stoller, author of Monopoly Focus Newsletter Big and an antitrust policy analyst. In this big breakdown, I'm gonna ask the question, is Live Nation Ticketmaster, the company that controls most of the live entertainment industry, in fact, a criminal conspiracy? You might think that's a bold question, and it is. But some explosive new documents just came to light that suggest that, well, it's a question worth asking. Let's dive in. In 2010, the live entertainment industry was in shock when Live Nation, the nation's leading concert promoter, bought Ticketmaster, which basically had a, monopolist, a monopoly over ticketing software and was a major player in artist management. It was a very controversial deal, and Ticketmaster had already bought out most of its other competitors in ticketing software and really upset Pearl Jam in the 1990s. It was a well-known you know, market power problem. But the government's antitrust division under Obama allowed the deal to go forward anyway. In fact, it seems like they were sort of proud of doing that. Let's take a look at this public picture that was put on the DOJ's website. So that publicly released photo shows the head of the antitrust division, Christine Varney, her number two, William Cavanaugh, and their advisor, Gene Kimmelman, announcing that they were allowing that merger and talking to reporters about it. Now, the Biden antitrust division is very different than the Obama antitrust division. And they have been investigating Live Nation Ticketmaster, the firm that the Obama administration allowed to form. They've been investigating it for years. And when firms be, are being investigated, they tend to lawyer up. And so that's what Live Nation did, hiring an old antitrust lawyer named Dan Wall to represent them against potential monopolization charges that could be coming from the antitrust division. Wall defended Live Nation publicly as part of a PR campaign earlier last month in a blog post. He wrote that, you know, you might think that Live Nation charges a lot for tickets, but that's really just supply and demand for a popular artist. The corporation itself charges low prices, not high ones. He even put up a comparison of commissions charged by online marketplaces, from Twitch to Airbnb to Uber, to show how little Live Nation charges. Let's take a look. You see, Live Nation charges less than Twitch, StubHub, Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, et cetera. Concert promotion, Wall wrote, is not a highly profitable business, even for Live Nation, end quote. So look at that commission. It's a measly 7% for Live Nation Ticketmaster. Now, sure, Live Nation charges consumers a lot of money and doesn't pay much to artists. I mean, this was Wall's argument. But they don't, he wrote, set the ticket price. And even worse for Live Nation shareholders, at least, it's just not a very good business. Wall concluded, quote, the narrative that Ticketmaster fees are responsible for high ticket prices makes no sense. According to Wall, the middleman giant affects at most 2% of the price of a ticket for its trouble. Still, all of that, that argument from Dan Wall from, from Live Nation Ticketmaster feels weird. It sounds like it's not true, considering that Live Nation CEO Michael Rapino made $139 million in 2022. That's a lot of money for someone in just such a terrible business. Well, the reason it sounds like it's not true is because, well, it's not true. Or at least it's not true according to new documents released by Congressman Bill Pascrell from litigation in 2019 based on Live Nation's own financial data. These documents are from a court case uh, involving a concert at the New Jersey State Fair in 2011. Now, I just want to tell you where these documents came from because it's kind of funny. Um, we often think about monopolists as sort of dominant and, and powerful and all-knowing. And, and that litigation has been going on for 13 years. At a certain point, the, uh, the plaintiffs hired an expert. His name is Richard Barnett. He's one of the top scholars in the business. And, and he looked at Live Nation's confidential records, and he wrote up about how the corporation actually works. And the plaintiffs then submitted that report to the court. And the judge, unfortunately, ordered it sealed so that no one could read it, saying, ah, oh, it's got confidential information or, or whatnot. And that should have been that, except, and here's where the stupidity of a, of a monopolist comes in. Live Nation or someone's on Live, on Live Nation's legal team or Dan Wall's team or someone like that, they screwed up and they accidentally uploaded the report to a public court site, Pacer, where Pascrell got his hands on it. He just downloaded it. And then he sent it out in a press release and that's how we have the documents. Okay, so what's the case all about that shows how Live Nation really works? Well, it starts with a concert when, in 2011, the head of the New Jersey State Fair, his name is Al Dorso, hired a company called Juice Entertainment, run by two experienced concert promoters, to put on a concert. Now, Live Nation, they, they told Live Nation, do you want to do this? Live Nation wasn't interested. But as soon as they got wind that 
Juice Entertainment was doing it and started to book acts, Live Nation demanded to co-produce the show. And, and Dorso, who was running the, the uh, state fair, was just like, okay, you guys work it out. And he later put it, you know, the, the, the Live Nation, they were the, the 800 pound gorilla. I said, go see if you can work out a deal. That, that's what he was saying to Juice. Now, Juice and Live Nation couldn't work out a deal. And then Live Nation managed to get Juice fired. How? Well, the smaller firm sued Live Nation, claiming the giant coerced performers into not signing with Juice to appear at the fair and threatened to withhold its ticketing services to the venue, the state-owned Meadowlands Sports Complex, if it were not allowed to be a partner. That's from public reporting. In other words, Live Nation used dominance in other lines of business, artist promotion and ticketing software to thwart a rival, which is exactly why the Obama staffers like Gene Kimmelman should have blocked the merger in the first place. But this situation leaves a question. Why didn't Juice consent to let Live Nation co-produce the event? I mean, half the profit is still better than no profit, right? Well, the reason is, according to Juice, that Live Nation offered a deal that would have saddled the firm and, and artists with the costs while Live Nation itself took the profits. In this purported arrangement, Live Nation and Juice would have split the cost of putting on the event, like renting the venue, the soundstage, and so forth. They would have also shared profits from ticket sales with artists and with each other, and that sounds good so far. The problem is what came next. It's in the accounting. Here's the expert report. Live Nation negotiated third-party expenses like rental costs in the venues directly with vendors in exchange for exclusive financial gains not disclosed to their artists or their agents, managers, or independent co-promoters in the form of rebates. So in other words, Live Nation had secret side deals with vendors to inflate costs by overpaying those vendors and venues, which meant that any profit from the event would evaporate. It would look like a loss. Co-promoters and artists who share in profits would lose out but, and would be told that the show just wasn't profitable. But the thing is those vendors, those venues who had gotten extra money by being paid inflated costs would in turn remit that money back to Live Nation in the form of secret rebates. In other words, Juice would pay the inflated costs that would get furtively funneled back to Live Nation, along with all the profits from the show. Now, Live Nation didn't disclose any of this revenue diversion with the artists to whom it had a legal obligation, to whom it had, with, with whom it had contracts, which is why Juice's lawyer said that the corporation, quote, essentially defrauds everyone involved. Now, these kinds of secret kickbacks ensured what Juice's lawyer called the, quote, financial ruin, end quote, of co-promoters. Now, of course, Live Nation claimed it was losing money or not making very much money on any particular event, and it wasn't. But that's because the profit was coming in through rebates, which according to this expert Barnett, went on to a line in the accounting statement called, quote, contribution margin, end quote. So Juice's experts found, uh, so interestingly, Barnett even found that Live Nation kept two sets of books. So in, in one case, they posted an entry of $90,000 rent for settlement, but only $75,000 internally for the same item. They routinely put in profit and loss statements large losses while admitting that events actually made money. So that's just one event, all right? That's one uh, a state fair in New Jersey. How much was this contribution margin across all of Live Nation? I don't precisely know, and you can throw other things into that accounting uh, line, but there are hints of amounts. So in the third quarter of 2021, which is the last time they used the term contribution margin that I can find, it was $747 million, probably in the billions today. And that's where CEO Michael Rapino's nine-figure payday is probably coming from. Live Nation is generating a great deal of revenue, but somehow shows low margins, lots of events where they're not making money, but somehow the cash is coming in. Now, that's just a price hike, right? It's a, it's a way of extracting more revenue, but it's also hidden and hiding the price hikes is important because monopolization, which is about controlling a market and then extracting by your pricing power, is harder to prove if you show low margins, if you show that you're not charging very much. Their antitrust lawyer, Dan Wall, can just write, poor little live nation, our business is terrible. Yeah, and we all know that you bill by the hour, Dan, on your lovely silk sheets. Now, let's take a step back and recognize what we're really looking at. It's not just an extractive scheme. This is about power, power over our culture, power over an entire industry. Basically, Live Nation can present venues or other people in the business, anyone in the business pretty much, with a choice. If you cooperate quietly, you'll get extra hidden revenue. 
And that means cooperating with, with knowing dishonesty in the business. If not, well, Live Nation will maybe work with your rival or may just buy into the market to compete with you directly or may not let artists come to your shows. At any point, too, I mean, it's not just the, 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 the blunt instrument. At any point, Live Nation can dial up or down rebates to reward or punish. And that's increasingly true as Live Nation buys more and more corporations in and around the live event space, with each one presenting additional options for fees and rebates and what is essentially financial engineering. Okay, is this report true? I mean, why, like, you know, Live Nation would say, oh, they, they, they got it totally wrong. They didn't disprove it because I don't think they can, but, you know, the question is reasonable. Is the report true? We don't know. Um, it's, the expert is well-respected, and he looked at Live Nation's financial data. And it's, it is easy to believe the worst about Live Nation Ticketmaster. They have a really bad reputation in the industry and then among consumers. But the reason I think it's true, and I'm, I'm not sure, but the reason I buy it is because this particular story is consistent with the behavior of a lot of firms, many dominant middlemen firms in our economy, from pharmacy benefit managers to Amazon and their relationship with third-party sellers, how they mediate between third-party sellers and consumers, to big banks who securitized mortgages in the financial crisis, to the advertising technology industry, and so on and so forth. Now, they don't, most of them don't use two sets of books. That's kind of like, you know, that's a little bit, you know, above the, I'm not saying everyone's a criminal conspiracy, two sets of books, kind of a red flag. Uh, but in general, it's a business model. Middlemen who have market power, they use fees and kickbacks, often hidden through a complex maze of subsidiaries or, or overlapping lines of business to extract in ways that are really hard to see. It's inefficient, it's immoral, and more importantly, it creates a climate of fear. The problem is, it's also just the way that we do business today. Fortunately, Live Nation is under investigation and there are a bunch of companies that are under investigation. But this lesson, if this is true, and I think it is, but if it's true, this is why Live Nation needs to be broken up. And more broadly, why we need to get rid of these, this way of doing business, these secret kickbacks and rebates throughout the whole economy. Thanks for watching this big breakdown on the Breaking Points channel. If you'd like to know more about how big business and our economy really works, go to the link in the description below and sign up for my Market Power Focus newsletter, Big. Thanks, and have a good one. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.